I'm going to begin with a quote. Um, I also stroll around, which comes from my organizing history. I spent a lot of time with Catholic peace movements and um, predominantly POC-based religious organizations in suburban Long Island growing up, and I learned how to speak from preachers, so I'm going to do a little bit of preaching and hopefully <laughs> not too much preaching um, as, as we'll get to. Um, but I want to begin with a quote. This is from elusive anarchist author B. Traven. And supposedly he said, I'm in fact in no way more important than is the typesetter for my books, the man who works at the mill. No more important than the man who binds my books and the woman who wraps them and the scrub woman who cleans up the office. And I want to put aside the um, clearly outdated gendered language here, which is a subject matter we'll pick up later and then in question and answer. But this is something I certainly concur with. That in fact, without the combined efforts of AK Press, the Institute of Anarchist Studies, which co-published this book, Alex, of course, um, and the sponsoring organizations, I couldn't stand here in front of you and I could not have written and published this title. And I've given this talk now about two dozen times in the Pacific Northwest. I did an East Coast tour um, right before the term started. And I always like to begin with that kind of sediment, that it's not just me that was involved in producing this kind of work, and certainly it's not just me that has gotten to this particular location. And I always want to begin by acknowledging those in this room and in all the other rooms that I have spoken in. And I want to begin by acknowledging those dear family members, partners, lovers, companions, current and former students, colleagues, political associates, comrades, friends and possible enemies, and of course who is a friend and who is an enemy will be clarified during the question and answer portion of tonight. And I thank you for laughing because when I did that in the East Coast, nobody laughed at all. It felt so flat. Um, and I'm from the East Coast, so that really hurt. Um, but this is collective life. This is what I'm trying to get at at the book, and this is what I'm going to try to get at the talk. Because it's this web of relationships that I've just acknowledged that is the underlying social fabric that allows capitalism to exist. And of course, as you mentioned, whatever society we want to create after this will require to exist. And I want to not just acknowledge the unidirectional nature of acknowledgement that I've done here and then in these other rooms, but the multitudinous relationships that exist within this room and then expand beyond that. I want folks to keep that in mind because it's going back to this idea of collective life that I think is key for contemporary revolutionary movements and it's going to be key for what I'm trying to do. Um, but collective life is the substance, the materiality, the effects and emotions, and most importantly, the relationships that we produce and reproduce every day as part of just simply living as part of the human race on this planet, right? And what capital does, in Marx's words, is vampiric on this collective life. It sucks from this collective life. It draws from this collective life. And not just simply to create cultural products, but actually to, for all forms of production to take place, this collective life is necessary. And I will explain this a little further as I go along, but in Marx's conception, capital requires one commodity amongst all others, and that is labor power, the ability of workers to work. And what reproduces labor power, as feminist scholars for the last 40 years have pointed to, is predominantly the unwaged labor performed by women and gender nonconforming people. So if labor power is the most important aspect, the most important commodity in the capitalist system, its reproduction, its actual production, is a key site of political struggle. And also, the collective life that is situated and allows labor power to be reproduced is a key site for political intervention and struggle. But collective life has been framed in various different ways. Some have referred to this as the commons, or commoning, that is the act of producing the commons. Autonomous Marxists have referred to this as self-activity or self-valorization. Anarchists identify this as mutual aid. And different revolutionary traditions have looked at collective life and come up with different ways of framing it, different ways of cutting away different aspects of it to describe and identify and see as important. And what I'm hoping that we can try to do here and then in our movements is understand how this collective life functions and how it's foundational 
for all forms of revolutionary struggle, as well as all forms of life. What I'm going to do in the remainder of this talk is cover 500 years of struggle against capitalism. <laughs> 500 years of history. It's going to be really quick. Hold on. As I said, I am from the Northeast, so I'm going to speak really fast. Um, clearly, there's no way of accomplishing such a task. So I'm going to give you three different stories, three different anecdotes. One under slavery, another from peasant societies, and a third from the shift, what I call, and other scholars call the shift from the industrial to the social factory. I'm going to give you those three examples of a way of grounding these ideas of collective life and then everyday resistance I'm going to talk about. And hopefully that will also take us through this last 500 years of history. So I'm going to provide that. But first I want to talk a little bit more about everyday resistance, collective life, and some of the concepts I'm going to be using so that those in the room who are not maybe familiar with some of those ideas will have a little way of entering that conversation. And then I'm going to use these examples as a way to arc into the contemporary period because if we're talking about collective life and we're talking about forms of everyday resistance. Without talking about organizing, we're not going to ground those conceptions in any kind of substantive revolutionary struggle. And I think actually, in fact, what I'm trying to provide challenges underlying assumptions and I think problematic assumptions about how organizing functions in the United States in the revolutionary and left guise. So I want to begin by collective, uh, defining collective life a little bit better. And this is going to arc into the concept of everyday resistance, which the book is on. I'm going to read from the introduction here. And I'm going to resist telling you to turn to page 12 since I am an instructor. And usually that's how I do this. Um, but those who have looked at a copy or have a copy, it is on page 12. Um, Two aspects of human life impressed me most during the journeys I made in my youth across suburban Long Island and in the green mountains of Vermont. One was the ingenious methods of survival, authentic communication, daring acts of kind-heartedness and mutuality, and an embodied, productive sense of commonality that confronted untold deficiencies in the material needs of existence. The other was that ongoing, seemingly endless struggle to improve the human condition reorganization of ecological and spatial sensibilities, and reordering of time toward an ordinary pace of life, and an immense output of creativity and ideas, even in the most inhospitable of locales with the most restrictive of conditions. The first aspect articulates mutual aid. The second, a degree of refusal. Being productive in common is where these excursions meet. As I began to investigate this nexus, other practices, methods of organizing, and forms of life popped out of the shadows like lightning bugs at dusk. Peter Kropotkin's Mutual Aid carries the subtitle, A Factor of Evolution. Throughout Mutual Aid, Kropotkin corrects the social Darwinist misconception that competition defined human evolution. Then he humbly offers Mutual Aid as a factor in the unfolding of life on the planet, resulting in human societies. Everyday resistance is a factor in revolutionary struggle not the sole factor. Answering how everyday resistance, that is, refusals of work and practices of mutual aid, is a factor in revolution is the task of this book and, of course, by extension, the task of this talk. Gorillas a Desire offers a contentious hypothesis. The fundamental assumption underlying left and radical organizing, including many strains of anarchism, <coughs> is wrong. I do not mean organizationally dishonest, ideologically inappropriate, or immoral. I mean empirically incorrect. Historical and current strategies on the left and in radical movements are predicated on the assumption that working class and poor people are unorganized and are not resisting. Hence, the role of the activist, organizer, and insurrectionist is to activate, organize, and educate and disengage population through various initiatives. Illustrating that everyday resistance is a factor in revolution and a form of politics, maintaining that its effects on overt rebellion and crises in capitalism are measurable, requires the reversal of this assumption. Working class and poor peoples, as slaves, peasants, and workers in the industrial and social factory, are already organized and are already resisting. Describing the myriad forms of everyday resistance under slavery, in peasant politics and throughout the industrial and social factory is an immense undertaking, as I hinted at before. The transatlantic slave trade, peasant politics, and the industrial factory emerged during an era marked by the advent of capitalism and the modern nation state. That is the period between the 14th century and the present. This book limits its focus to the refusal of work 
as it appears in everyday life, and how this relates to and intersects with overt rebellions against work. That means I'm not dealing with all other forms of everyday struggle and resistance, which we'll get into, hopefully, in question and answer. Herein, I address the revolt against work, examine working class self-activity and mutual aid, and consider how to apply a taxonomy of struggle to the historical record as a sense-making machine to understand these phenomena. Refusals by guerrillas of desire take place outside of the normal surveillance mechanisms of capitalism in the state. The relationships based on mutual aid are produced in this often temporary space. These practices are intended to be illegible to the state, and so they should, at all costs, remain. Guerrillas of Desire is an historical work for this reason, as there is little concern that the guilty parties, slaves, peasants, and industrial workers long dead, would suffer state repression as a result of exposure here. While I seek here to provide tools for contemporary struggle, mechanisms for uncovering and amplifying everyday resistance practices will need to be developed in situ. One of the things I'll focus on when we get to organizing is in fact these things are so specific to their context, to the forms of work, the kinds of life, the cultural practices, to gender and racialized relations of power, then in fact it's impossible to talk about these in the abstract. So when we get to question and answer and someone says, what do we do in Corvallis? I'm going to tell you I have no fucking clue. <laughs> because I shouldn't. Because this is my second visit here in five years. These are things that need to be developed and contextualized and understood in that specific context. And I want to get away from universal claims and also these problematic, overarching, vague ideas of organizing and revolutionary struggle that too often find themselves into the left. So if you don't mind me getting a little metaphorical for a second. Guerrilla attacks take place in valleys populated by tax collectors, managers, and bureaucrats. Guerrillas make excursions from the hills and liberated territories populated by commoners whose ongoing acts of resistance produce the commons. Typically, an ambush is followed by a tactical retreat, and guerrillas use stolen goods and storehouse raids to meet the needs of the population. By addressing needs that the state and capital have not met or have refused to address, guerrillas develop a sense of solidarity and interdependence with the people. If the guerrillas can create a gravitational pull within a community, tugging the population further away from state and capital, the general population will provide cover for guerrilla actions. The solidarity, communication networks, and mutual aid that already exist within the general population are given to guerrillas and used by them to carry out actions over a wider area. With increased support comes an increased chance of operational success and often the ability to avoid capture. Squirmishes erupt as guerrillas continue to enter and then flee the valleys for the relative safety of the hills. Raids on armories, sabotage of the machinery of production, arson of the slave masters or bureaucrats' homes becomes part of this assembled counter-narrative and then hence counter-institutions. These are complementary practices chosen contextually to address the immediate needs and desires of guerrilla forces. This is the model anyway. However, models and theory should not be substituted the complexity is a concrete reality. And it's to some of that concrete reality I want to turn. But I haven't given you a definition of everyday resistance yet. Let me skip over that and give you a definition of overt rebellion. By overt rebellion, I mean all forms of organized declared political activity, right? Unions, political parties, anarchist collectives, Antifa crews, et cetera, et cetera. That's a declared overt form of rebellion and activity. Even clandestine organizations are going to have to declare themselves against the established order. Everyday resistance, which is why I use the metaphor of guerrilla warfare, actually seek not to declare themselves against the established order as part and parcel of its operating mechanism and principle in order to avoid that direct conflict. This is about skirmishes. This is about stealing. This is about running away. This is about all kinds of things that are trying to undermine the order, create opportunities for survival, create opportunity for further forms of rebellion to emerge, but in fact do not declare themselves against the established order, even as they operate against that order. And I also want to provide a definition of work, because I'm not looking at all forms of resistance over the last 500 years of capitalism. I'm looking at the revolt against work specifically and only. And there's a particular reason I'm doing that. I 
coming from the autonomous tradition, believe the central operating mechanism of capitalism is the imposition of work. If you cannot impose work, you cannot produce commodities. You cannot produce commodities, you can't circulate them. You can't circulate in them, you can't produce surplus value and profit, you can't create markets, etc., etc., etc. If the imposition of work does not take place, in fact, there is no way for the rest of the capitalist order to function. So I focus in on, as others in the tradition I'm part of, on work and imposed work and the resistance to the imposition of work. And the resistance and imposition of work and work itself are imposed on two separate levels. The first is the one you probably all experienced every day when you go to work, right? You show up, I work at a warehouse from eight to four, four days a week. I show up, the boss expects me to do certain tasks during that time period in certain order, in certain ways, et cetera, et cetera. That's a particular imposition of that kind of social relation. In addition to that, work is imposed on the population to such an extent that even the absence of work is an imposition of work. Which seems contradictory, but let me get to that in a second. How could the absence of work be an imposition of work? Well, for the last 500 years, we've had an ongoing process of enclosure, enclosure of common lands. So the only way to survive under capitalism is to access a wage. And if you can't access a wage, you're fucked. Or the state periodically, due to social struggle and other um, demands made by the populace, might provide some kind of paltry uh, welfare wage, right? Because there aren't other methods of survival, of producing food, clothing, housing, other things you need, you have to access a wage. You have to go to work. That is an imposition on the population of a particular regime. And we can see many different kinds of regimes of work over these last 500 years. So in fact, the absence of work is an imposition of this social relation. And being that I see this as a central operating mechanism of capitalism, its refusal in everyday life seems as a key place to start looking for other kinds of activities. And as you'll see shortly as I get into some of these actual examples, I'm using an expanded notion of the working class. I'm defining all those who suffer under the imposition of work, who refuse work, are part of this larger working class. Slaves, peasants, and industrial workers. But I'm adding an additional category because of the feminist struggles of the last 40 years and the influence of people like Grace Lee Boggs, who's here on the flyer in front of you, to include all those who work without a wage. Because work under capitalism doesn't just come with a wage. Sometimes it's hidden behind a wage. And I gave this talk yesterday in class, and people were like, oh, there aren't this social character anymore. What are you talking about? So what I'm referring to here is the housewife. And that seems like an outdated term for all kinds of good reasons. But for a good portion of the history of capitalism, especially before the last uh, wave of feminist struggles, the housewife produced labor power. Labor power was produced over and over and over and over again under capitalism by women generic conforming peoples who are not paid a wage. And in fact, if the only way to access a life under capitalism and resources you need under capitalism is a wage, what happens to those individuals who don't have access to their wage? We're hidden behind the quote unquote male wage. Well, let's, we can do away maybe with that concept of the housewife. We've seen fundamental social shifts. According to the US uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics website from 2015, and the statistics are not good enough, I would argue, because it only deals with two gender binary categories, and we don't really have a good understanding of gender nonconforming folks and trans folks, and folks who are trying to escape that binary and escape this imposed work. But Boley gave us a little something to work with. And that looks at what people do in their time outside of work and how that breaks down by gender. So even after 40 years of feminist struggle, women, and I'm going to add gender nonconforming people even though it's not including the bully statistics here, are doing 70% of the cooking, cleaning, caring for kids, caring for the elderly, caring for basically reproducing labor power and the species. That's in the United States. It's worse elsewhere. And the question is, politically, why is that still the case? And why, in fact, has this not been put on our political agenda in a more substantive way? Let me move into my examples, so we're going to come back to some of this as I go along. Um, I want to begin with uh, everyday resistance under slavery. How many people have heard of Nat Turner? A whole bunch, right? Most of you have probably heard about this by the time you graduated high school. It should have been in some basic American history courses. 
Nat Turner and Nat Turner's story is really important for the story I want to tell for some very specific reasons. During August of 1831, Nat Turner led the largest slave rebellion in all of American history. And I mean largest in regards to how many people were involved and also the damage to the slaveocracy. And this rebellion was repressed on the 23rd of August, 1831, after about two weeks. Nat Turner then goes on the run. He hides out in swamps, he hides out in forests, he hides out and avoids escape as long as he possibly can. He's eventually captured. And then he speaks to his lawyer and provides a quote unquote confession of his crimes. And in fact, it's not a confession, it's an explanation justification for his quote unquote crimes. And in this, he says a couple of very, very interesting things that led him to the point of rising up and rebelling against the slaveocracy. And this is from what I'm about to read is from his lips to the pen of his attorney, to his uh, the individual who took this confession. And he says, about this time I was placed under an overseer. And he's speaking about the time he's coming into consciousness, his own self-understanding of his role as a slave and his need to rebel. About this time I was placed under an overseer for whom I ran away. And after remaining in the woods 30 days, I returned to the astonishment of the slaves on the plantation who thought I had made my escape to some other part of the country as my father had done before. Nat Turner did not need some union bureaucrat. He did not need some college professor, and he sure as hell didn't need some political party apparatchik to tell him about his social conditions. He encountered power directly every day of his life. The circulated stories and narratives that were told among slaves the story passed down of his father who had run away, right, is his education and his understanding and how he developed his own political consciousness in order then to collect together fellow slaves and some supportive whites, poor whites, seize guns and launch an armed rebellion against the state. He didn't need these other forms of political education that we presume that people must have before they engage in any kind of substantive act. And the interesting thing is that for every Nat Turner, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of other individuals whose names we do not know, who followed the same kind of political trajectory and also participated in these kind of rebellions. So we yeah, have lists of slaves who are hung during rebellions, but we still don't have those who burned down their master's barn, who stole those guns, who provided food for slaves who had run away, and actually, in fact, the Fugitive Slave Act, which was one of the major contributing factors to the US Civil War, was only possible because millions and millions of slaves were, were running away. Yes, the Underground Railroad. There was no railroad. It was not technically underground by any means. But in fact, those kind of activities of the Underground Railroad required forms of everyday resistance and collective life to function. If you run away as he did for 30 days, or he ran away and then was on the lam for two months, or as his father had done before him, you need access to information. You need to know who's coming after you. You need access to food. You need access to terrain. You need access to all kinds of things in order to actually travel from maybe the South to freedom in Canada. It's these kind of everyday acts that are part of this larger web of collective resistance that we not only need to acknowledge and honor, but also, also look for our own contemporary movements. So let me move on and provide another example. Oh, before I do, I also want to draw two other points out now rather than doing them later. One, that Nat Turner was involved in running away, stealing food, leaving food supplies aside for individuals who were on the land themselves. Uh, he took numerous steps in his everyday life to get to the point of seizing guns, organizing fellow slaves, and launching this rebellion. There's an ongoing process that I think if we sat down and looked at those who participated in such contemporary movements or recent movements such as Grace Lee Boggs and looked at the 100 years of her life, you'd see these little steps, these small steps that people took before involving themselves in these kind of movements. And those steps are really, really important. Nat Turner took them, we take them, and many of us are taking those right now. And how do we see that actually playing out in our organizing and in our overt rebellions? And there's also a direct relationship between everyday resistance and overt rebellion. That in fact, if we look back through every overt rebellion that's taken place from Occupy to Black Lives Matter, all these other social movements, we look back through those, we're gonna find these everyday forms of resistance that build up 
that circulate, that actually overt rebellion, I hate the metaphor of a uh, tip of the iceberg, but it's apropos, it works, that in fact, overt rebellion leans on all these other forms of everyday resistance. Because in fact, if you look at the feminist struggle, and I've mentioned that twice now, so for a third time, only about a half to 1% of women in the United States ever participated in the feminist struggle here in the United States in any substantive fashion. My mother didn't. But she's gained considerably from those kind of social movements. She sees her part of those larger societal changes, right? And in fact, I think we need to acknowledge when these overt rebellions take place, all these other kind of life activities that are shifting. Because 1% of the American uh, population, maybe 2% is participating in the environmental movement. Around 1.5% of African Americans participated in the civil rights movement, right? So these other societal changes are taking place because of these other acts of everyday struggle. And I think when we don't acknowledge those, we miss a huge part of what, in fact, is taking place. I'll only move on quickly and provide another example in peasant politics. So I want to take you to Southeast Asia in the late 1970s. And an American scholar by the names of James C. Scott is doing his field work. This will then become the book Weapons of the Week for those who might be familiar with this kind of material and where I'm going here. Um, but uh, he was involved in civil rights struggles, anti-war struggles, and then he shows up in Southeast Asia and he's like, so where are the student groups? Where are the unions? Where are the political parties? And he didn't find any, not one, at all, during this time period. Let me pause there. Southeast Asia, 1970s. What just took place in that region? Well, peasant uprisings that were brutally suppressed and repressed by the largest military and largest militaries on the planet, right? So you're dealing with a population of peasants who've gone, un gone through untold traumas, loss, politically and otherwise, right? So Scott shows up and he starts looking for these forms of political organization. He doesn't find any. So he takes a step back and says, okay, what's actually taking place in these communities? He's in a territory that he's now called Zamia, so the um, hill lands of Southeast Asia, the quote unquote hill peoples who've tried to escape uh, state encroachment and the like, or void the state altogether. And he starts looking at various labor saving technologies that are being implemented in these kind of communities, right at the border zone between where the state is and where people can escape the state. And very often folks are coming down from the hills and working in these kind of um, quote unquote plantations where you receive a wage. And what he sees is the imposition of new labor saving technologies, quite late to this region, but the Green Revolution used these technologies earlier in the 50s in other parts of the global south and in peasant communities, even here in the US. And he sees the use of the combine harvester, piece of machinery that can do the work of a dozen, a hundred peasants, right? And what the peasants know is when this thing pulls up, they're out of work that they are not needed for thrashing, they're not needed for harvest. And if the combine harvester is doing that work and they're thrown out of that work and they have no other way of accessing the means of survival, that this piece of machinery is in fact the source of their immiseration. <laughs> but they don't go to a political party, they don't go to the state, they don't go form a union in order to make demands around this. They take direct action and they discover that if you put sugar in a gas tank, the machine won't run. And if you set them ablaze, they blow up. And if you break their windshields, they're not usable, right? So this is the foreign political struggle they chose to engage in. Direct action specifically against this machine of immiseration. And I want folks to think about the risks that folks might be taking in Southeast Asia as peasants to undergo this kind of political struggle during these years. If the plantation owner finds you setting ablaze his combine harvester, he's not going to call the police. You're not going to be charged. They're going to murder you. They're going to kill you where you stand, right? So what kind of level of solidarity, communication, and mutual aid is needed among this population to carry out these acts? And we could question later if you know, these are substantive political acts, if these were successful, or these strategies that should be honored today, yada, 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 right? Let's put that aside for a second. Think about the level of communication solidarity mutual aid needed to carry out these acts. Because if you think down the block, Bob's turning your ass in, you're not telling Bob what you're up to that night. And you're not gonna let Bob know what's going on. And in fact, if 
the patrol is coming around, you need to know when the patrol is coming around so you're not, you know, out there with your uh, gas can and your lighter thinking that you're going to set that carbine harvester ablaze and then you're going to get away. Um, and there needs to be a level of trust, of substantive trust in the communities to, for these acts to take place. And in fact, Scott saw this, observed this, saw these acts. And in fact, the reason I mentioned these is because these forms of solidarity, mutual aid, and communication are part of collective life and actually existed under slavery, as I hinted at quite a bit just before, and we're going to find in the industrial and social factory as well. Solidarity, communication, mutual aid. These are taxonomical categories for trying to understand and grapple with collective life and also the forms of resistance that come out of that collective life. Let me give you one more example. And this comes from my own personal history. Let's call this guy Frank. I worked in a metal fabrication facility in Portland, Oregon uh, from 2007-2008 until 2012 when I decided to make a terrible life choice and go back to grad school. Um, something we'll certainly talk about with many grad students here. Um, There's a guy Frank. Frank was a foreman felon. The employer that I worked for was felon friendly. So of the 400 guys, and there was only guys who worked on the factory floor because the boss would not hire women, except for his wife who worked in the office. So think a, um, a canopy, uh, a, uh, a metal fabrication facility that's about the size of six football fields, 400 guys working under it. Um, half of them are felons because the boss used to be a felon. And in that one moment of altruism, he then discovered that he could highly exploit felons. <laughs> by paying them shit wages and threatening to fire them when they talk about unionization or like needing a day off to go to the doctor and things along those lines. Um, but Frank was a former felon. Um, and Frank had a wife and a kid and had rent and he had bills and he had all kinds of stuff he had to deal with. Frank could not get his ass to work on time. He missed the bus, his car broke down, he missed his ride. Literally every day there was a new excuse why Frank couldn't get his ass to work on time. And if Frank didn't get to work on time, he'd be written up. And if he got written up enough times, he'd be fired on cause. If he got fired on cause, he'd lose his parole. He wouldn't be able to pay his rent, feed his wife and kid, feed his family, and go about his life. So what I and other people did was we punched Frank in. I would take my time card, i put his time card right behind mine, and da-ding, Frank's in, on, in to work on time. And I did this, the other guy in the office did this, actually one of the supervisors who was kind of privy to a situation did this, other people on the factory floor did this. And this is a small, tiny little act. But these kind of acts take place all the time, in every workplace. And this kind of counter planning, or subversion, is actually not the exception, but in fact the rule. And before I say a little bit more about this as a principle and idea, I'm going to provide a quote from Trudadanian Marxist C.L.R. James, uh, Chinese American luminary Grace Lee Boggs, uh, and uh, their French theoretician counterpart Cornelius Castoritis. And they were identifying these same kind of things that I saw in the uh, mid end of the aughts in a metal fabrication facility in Portland, Oregon. They were identifying this in Detroit auto plants and French auto plants in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And they wrote a book called Facing Reality, which is always, especially if you like the Grace Lee Boggs film, um, worth taking a peek at. And what they said about this activity is actually quite similar to the activity that I saw, and I want to read this for you. In one department of a certain plant in the United States, there is a worker who is physically incapable of carrying out his duties. But he is a man with a wife and children, and his condition is due to the previous strain of his work in the plant. The workers in that department have organized their work so that for nearly 10 years he has had practically nothing to do. They have defied all efforts of the foreman and supervisor to discharge him, threatening to throw the whole plant into disorder if any steps are taken to dismiss him. And then they conclude, that is the socialist society. That's not the socialist society in the sense of full accessible health care. That's not the social society that might exist after capitalism. That's not the social society that we organize our life activities in such a way where we're not all doing shitty jobs in order to survive and actually provide 
basic need services and meet each other's desires in substantive ways. That's not the social society they're talking about or I'm talking about. What they're talking about is the possibility of other forms of organizing and life emerging out of that simple act in order to create this new socialist society, of which we do not have a necessarily a vision of, that is not teleological, that is not heading towards some utopian point, but in fact will emerge and decide and determine its own path through these kind of activities. And in fact, what I just mentioned, these kinds of counterplanning and forms of subversion take place all the time. And not just in the industrial factory that I worked in or the industrial factory that Grace Lee Boggs, C.L.R. James, and Cornelius Castoritis were writing about, but actually, in fact, in all kinds of workplaces. This takes place in the quote unquote social factory. That is the factory model of think the Fordist plant where you know someone screws in a bit and someone screws in a bit and someone puts on a door and someone puts the window in. Where that exists at here at the university or at Starbucks. But all these kind of social factory and industrial material production type jobs, people are doing these kind of acts all the time. Sometimes just to get the goddamn job done because the boss thinks you should do A, B, and C. And you know you can do it X, Y, and Z in half the time and then have a nice little break for yourself, right? These things are happening all the time and are identifiable. And what I refer to this in the book is another way of looking at everyday resistance. This is also a taxonomy of struggle. And these include all kinds of forms of resistance. Theft, sabotage, facing illness. Think of how many times you've called in sick to work when you were not sick. I did that today <laughs> to come here. Uh, in fact, uh, suicide even. Using suicide where those exiting slave ships would drown themselves and kill their children rather than enter into that life. Slowdowns and strikes, counterplanning, squatting, exodus, arson, and even murder. Because there are those that might suggest, as I would, that there's very little difference between slitting the uh, throat of a slave master, asleep on his bed, and an abusive husband. And in fact, both of these are small acts that are trying to refuse these kind of gendered, racialized, and capitalist impositions. And how do we escape those, and how do we actually go beyond the limits of our contemporary organizing paradigms is where I want to turn to next. And then I'll close up and give plenty of time for question and answer. So, let me review. Taxonomy of struggle. In two various different frames, I want to talk about forms of collective life and everyday resistance. In the first frame, there is uh, communication, solidarity, and mutual aid. In the second, there's theft, sabotage, counterplanning, et cetera, et cetera. And not only do I think these are identifiable across the board in regards to the last 500 years of capitalist development and capitalist history, but I think these are tools of struggle to actually identify those in the contemporary period. And not all these are going to be identifiable, and you're not going to be able to find all these, because what do you do when you're an Uber driver? Because that was the first question I got when I gave this talk in Seattle. Well, actually, Uber drivers have come up with all kinds of creative ways to get around this. Having a second phone, using a secondary backup app. In, uh, in, I wasn't in Boston, but I was in Amherst. Uh, Uber drivers in Boston got together and met before they went out for the night. So there's ways in which collective organizing in, this, in these different guises, and if we pull on these little things, if we pull on a little bit of solidarity or communication, what other forms of resistance expose themselves? When we don't presume how people resist, or presume how people organize, or presume what people think and what they do in their lives when it doesn't look like the kind of left politics we might be involved in, right? So how do we pull on communication, or how do we pull on solidarity? And sometimes exciting things come out, right? Because this is gonna look different in prisons than it is uh, among Uber drivers in Boston. And it's actually going to look different with Uber drivers in Boston than Uber drivers in Seattle, because what they did in Seattle was, just as with a group of truckers, they went out to specific immigrant refugee communities were like, hey, why don't you all join our, join up with Uber, knowing quite well, obviously, or, or you know, directly or indirectly, that because there was good union working class jobs as cabbies, were predominantly white in Seattle, there was going to create a racial rift there between Uber drivers who were predominantly refugees and then white cabbies, right? So how in fact are these forms of taxonomy, these taxonomical categories that I'm using, how can we tug on them to see what other kinds of resistance might roll out? I'm also making a general claim here that there is a generalized revolt against work taking place throughout the 500 years of capitalism. That in fact acquiescence to these conditions is rarer than forms of resistance. And that actually 
this has huge implications for organizing a revolutionary struggle, and this has huge implications for politics. So to transition into that, I'm going to read from the book again. This is from the last chapter on organizing. In perusing organizing manuals from labor notes, the War Resisters League, Service Employee International Union, and the Industrial Workers of the World, and a number of other organizations that I'll mention we've talked about and we'll get to. It's remarkable how nearly none of them answer a simple question. Where do organizers and organizations come from? Nearly all begin and continue as the War Resisters League manual does, with the first chapter providing an ideological justification for the organization's politics, only to be trailed by organizing a local group as the second chapter. The Labor Notes Manual, a troublemaker's handbook, starts, with, or starts by suggesting that organize, organizers initiate organizing by asking questions and listening to the answers. And sure, fair enough. But then the guide goes on to mapping one's workplace. Only 52 words in the handbook are dedicated to finding, quote unquote, the natural leaders. So those unfamiliar, Troublemaker's Handbook until recently, and Labor Notes came out with actually a great new one that I use materials for, for workshops, brand new um, uh, organizer's manual. But the Troublemaker's Handbook, arguably for the last 30 years, has been the Bible of left labor, right? It's the go-to. 52 words in that manual address finding these actual forms of struggle and relationships that exist in those organizations, in those workplaces, in those kind of spaces which you're organizing. And then I went through about 50 other manuals and I found almost none addressing that whatsoever. So as I'm claiming that this is a huge area of life that we need to pay attention to that matters to just not our survival as a species and the overthrow of capitalism, but actually to our lives under capitalism and struggling against it, then why don't our, our manuals talk about that? Well, I have a little story for you and it's not a happy one. So here in Oregon, SEIU created a project called uh, We Are Oregon focused on housing struggles, based out of Portland, but I know they had staff members elsewhere too. Um, SAU funded the project initially for three years and then came up with some monies as it went on after that. And unlike traditional labor organizing, they said, hey, what's the biggest issue going on in the Portland region today? And for those who are not familiar, it's housing, housing prices. And we are Oregon went out and according to my sources, my secret sources, they spoke to about 35,000 people um, over the course of the project, who all talked about housing. And housing in regards to uh, predominantly folks of color losing their homes because of the increase of taxes, decrease of services, folks not being able to afford rental housing in the Portland region. Um, there was a big problem the SAU had with this project and it was wildly fucking successful. They saved people's homes, they got some legislation passed, including we went from a 30 day no cause eviction to 90 day. Because if you're in a tight rental market and your landlord says, get your ass out in 30 days, you're looking for a new place. You're not fighting eviction and that. 90 days gives us that space of struggle, right? So a number of things came out of that. Portland Solidarity Network, of which I was part of. Um, other housing defense groups came out of that, right? The problem is, is that it got national press, international press, all kinds of things. What it didn't do was add one more member to SEIU. <laughs> so they cut the funding. And they went on to whatever fast food bullshit they were doing and threw that at the wall and something else, right? And in fact, not just does organized labor do this, nonprofit sector does this. Other radicals, my anarchist comrades do this all the time, right? If it does not actually improve the condition of the bottom line of that organization or the initiative or the ideological precursors and assumptions of those involved in it, they don't see it as valid. So let's look at what's going on in Portland right now. Teachers are going on strike. I'm part of the Portland State University Faculty Association. We're going out for contract negotiations. Public sector workers are going on, uh, probably going on strike as well. Would have been really, really useful to have those 35,000 names and addresses and emails and phone numbers, but it's locked in some SEIU cabinet, um, which maybe I and some other anarchists will go find and get a hold of at some point. Um, but I'm sure as you know, on the state level we've lost a legislative initiative after legislative initiative after legislative initiative when it comes to basic worker and housing protections. You cannot deal with the rising housing costs in Portland, even stemming that tide or 
tourniqueting off the bleeding and not deal with wages eventually. <laughs> if those 35,000 people were really psyched about housing issues, that, that, that cycle of struggle, those struggles would have circulated back to wages because I work at a warehouse and I teach and Portland State University faculty make less than $1,000 a month after taxes and I make slightly better than minimum wage and I could have that $15 an hour that we are not getting to anytime soon and we sure shit didn't win. Had some nice steps toward, right? But that doesn't allow me to live in Portland because there's no neighborhood in Portland where people can live for $15, $15 an hour. So the short-sightedness of so much of the left in the revolutionary movements for their own organizational bottom line and not seeing how struggles circulate, right? And also how struggles might emerge out of others. Before Black Lives Matter BLM was a uh, hashtag around the world and pizzas were being sent to people in prison um, from North Africa, did anyone think that rebellion was a, a new black liberation movement was gonna explode in the, across the country? Nope, not at all. Also, we've not been able to pass substantive worker protections and housing uh, um, protections in Portland, in the metro, on the state level. But also let's think about SEIU's bottom line. What about those 35,000 people who have relationships and coworkers and family members and partners and all kinds of things? And the biggest trouble that business unions, organized labor has is that working people don't trust them for freaking goddamn good reasons. I mean, I grew up um, in suburban New York and my mom was a, a union librarian and she never met a steward in 35 years. Never met a union official. The newspaper showed up at our doorstep, usually with the buy American, don't buy Japanese, and by the way, it was only the first three letters they used, as they did in World War II, as they furthered their white supremacist agenda, right? And still have not substantively come out and apologized for of the toxic politics of which they were involved in that organized labor was part of in the 80s and 90s. Because I saw those newspapers come home those, you know, buy American, screw the Japanese, um, usually with racial epithets. Um, so what is the short-sightedness of that kind of organizing strategy that doesn't just apply to this particular example, but to so many other examples? I'm going to go back and read a little and hopefully bring some of these points I'm trying to make to a close into something a little bit more productive. Each of these manuals continue by describing coalition building working with different fully formed constituencies and mounting media strategies. Rarely is there a section on developing conversations and dialogues. None address how to inquire to existing modes of informal organizing or methods of survival in any substantive way. There is an approach not yet described that I will refer to as organizations all the way down. What are the integral elements of an organization? Where are their precursors? Who told the hallowed stories that predate its formation? What experiences and encounters has the organizer emerged from? Where have these been recorded? And how can those of us acting in common amplify, circulate, propagate these experiences and expressions? What are the constituent elements, forces, relationships, materials, needs, and desires that came together and allowed this organization to emerge? A response to these queries would require militants to investigate the constituent elements forces, relationships, materials, needs and desires that could emerge and are in fact emerging. Becoming attuned to the taxonomy of struggle, to everyday resistance in this manner, in turn requires a new type of organizer. Organizers to come will develop out of personal experiences marked by the refusal of work and practices of mutual aid. They'll use analyses of the rich and substantive history of revolutionary movements, in addition to staging encounters with one another that will produce circulate and accumulate knowledge. These organizers will always be growing, always becoming facilitators, ethnographers, inventors of culture and custom, and coordinators of collective life. Community dialogues are just one method of uncovering everyday resistance. To this we can add assemblies, surveys, inquiries, engage public performances, and other means. It is from these processes that the principles that define a new society will emerge. The role of the organizer is to further the revolutionary becoming of those whom which they engage. I'm not suggesting that relationships happen naturally, spontaneously, or by simply following a whim. Encounter is an intensive and inventive process, and one does not simply conclude the process. Just as we do not stop learning to the course of our lives, 
Organizers do not earn their designation by reading a manual, and militants do not become revolutionary by bestowing that label upon themselves. Similarly, there is no difference between organizers to come and guerrillas of desire. The organizer and the guerrilla are points on a continuum. The role of this new type of organizer is defined by one's inquiry into everyday resistance. The organizer's task is to assist with the emergence and growth of this resistance, to amplify and circulate its struggles, and the knowledge those struggles produce. This task is our task, and in the process, to go back to Grace Lee Boggs, C.L.R. James, and Corinna's Castoritis, we recognize the new society, align ourselves with it, and record the facts of its existence. In this sense, an organizer will be attentive toward addressing needs, such as creating survival pending revolution programs along the lines of the Black Panther Party, which will provide free breakfast, medical care, and access to urban farms. But also, the organizer must be attuned to desires, the desire to learn, the desire to commune, and to be productive, especially in common. To conclude, I see everyday resistance as a factor in revolutionary struggle, not the factor. So if we're going to dig into forms of everyday resistance that exist in our own communities, our job sites, et cetera, et cetera, we have to recognize that the next form of overt rebellion might not come from directly from these practices or the kinds of practices that I'm looking at and trying to identify in the revolt against the imposition of work. Two quickie examples. Pipeline struggles. Arguably, the most important commodity for capitalism after labor power is hydrocarbons, is energy, right? So pipeline struggles, preventing pipelines from polluting the environment, from crisscrossing um, public lands or indigenous territories, might in fact hemorrhage the system in such a way, causing a crisis that leaves us an opportunity to struggle further. In a similar fashion, the continuing challenge to the gender binary and the attack on the nuclear family, the quote unquote nuclear family structure and the unwaged work still being predominantly performed by women and gender nonconforming people, the challenge being brought to that by contemporary generations might in fact push capital to a crisis if in fact its labor power is not being reproduced for free anymore. If actual substance demands for childcare, equal wages, for paid housework, et cetera, et cetera, are being taken seriously and being forced upon the system. So in fact, I'm identifying a couple of forms of struggle, but there might be other forms of which turn out to be far more important. And to be attuned to these kind of struggles as they exist, I want to use a phrase from uh, uh, George Kafensis, who's an Italian, Italian, is a um, Greek-American political theorist and philosopher, that we need to read the struggles. We need to read these struggles as they function in the context in which they operate, right? We need to understand those and become attuned to those struggles that we're reading. And I want to suggest that we search, dig if necessary, until you find guerrillas of desire, historically and today, in concentration camps, prisons, kitchens, brothels, slave quarters, hillside peasant abodes, factory break rooms, and in rubble. And I have concluded each one of these talks with a chant. And I hope that you'll join me. I'm going to say it once. I hope you'll join me the second time. I'll read a concluding statement from the book. We'll say it one last time. We'll end up and then move to question and answer. Does that sound good? This is the organizer on the back. This is super serious. So yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Some of you might know this. The boss makes a dollar. I make a dime. That's why I poop on company time. <laughs> so join me with this. The boss makes a dollar. I make a dime. That's why I poop on company time. It is those who inhabit the small, nearly imperceptible moments who are the harbingers of refusal and resistance, rebellion, and possible revolution. Thus, the new society exists in the refusal of work in the embrace of mutual aid and working class self-activity. The new society begins, in part, in everyday resistance. One last time. Boss makes a dollar, I make a dime. That's why I poop on company time. Well, thanks for listening. <laughs>